get started. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to an all-new Sermons in the Park. As always, I am your Reverend Jamie McCaskill. I want to thank each and every one of you for, be, for joining me here today. <coughs> it's always a joy to uh, be here with you each and every Sunday um, to deliver the message that uh, that, I, that we have for you today. Um, today we're going to be doing Job chapter 18. But before we get started, let's take this time to thank our Heavenly Father for all the gifts that He's given us. Thank you, Father, for allowing me to be here today. Thank you for allowing me to uh, be able to deliver the message from the book of Job to uh, all those who, 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 who listen, uh, you know, whether it be on Sunday or when they watch it later after uh, we're done here on YouTube. Thank you, Father, for all the love and, and joy that you give us. Thank you for all the healings that you deliver to those who, who need it. Uh, Father, we, uh, we, we understand that, uh, that you are God. You are the one who, who, who gives us our breath and our food and our water and everything that we, we could possibly need. And you, Lord, give it to us before we even need to ask for it. And we thank you for that. Thank you for giving us your son, Jesus, who, who made it possible for us to have a relationship with you. You know, if, if it wasn't for him, Lord, we wouldn't, we wouldn't understand the grace that you have given us. Thank you, Father. I mean, so uh, this week we're in chat, like I said, we're in chapter 18 and, and uh, we see that Bildad, uh, <clears throat> he gets his turn to speak, and which is his second round of speeches. Uh, um, and what does he decide to do? Well, does he decide to take pity on his friend? No, 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 not him. He, you know, he decides that, uh, you know, since he can't reason with Job, um, He'll just scare him. You know, he'll put the, as some people like to say, the fear of God in him, you know. Um, he uh, he just starts talking about all the traps that are placed all around uh, to inst ensnare the wicked man who he, you know, let's face it, this friend, these friends think is Job. You know, he they, uh, Doldad believes that Job, uh, he's going to die. And uh, he's going to, not only is he going to die, he's going to die the death of a wicked you know, and he, he's very brutal when he tells Job that uh, he just needs to stop complaining and just be sensible. You know, he then he, he also uh, he turns to scorn, telling a long tale on uh, of the bad outcomes of the wicked man. Uh, we also see that he he was offended when Job described him and, you know, and the other friend, these other so-called friends. You know, back when, in chapter 12 when Job described them as animals. So let's let's go ahead and let's just get started. We're going to read Job chapter 18. We're going to read verses 1 all the way to 21. <coughs> then answered Bildad the Shuhite and said, How long will it be ere you make an end of the words? Mark, and afterwards we will speak. Wherefore are we counted as beasts, and reputed vile in your sight? He teareth himself in his anger. Shall the earth be forsaken for thee? And shall the rock be removed out of its place? Yea, the light of the wicked shall be put out, and the spark of his fire shall not shine. The light shall be dark in his tabernacle, and his candle shall be put out with him. The steps of his strength shall be straightened, and his own counsel shall cast him down. For he is cast into a net by his own feet, and he walketh upon a snare. The jinn shall take him by the heel, and the robber shall prevail against him. The snare is laid for him in the ground, and a trap for him in the way. Terrors shall make him afraid of every side and shall drive him to his feet his strength shall be hunger bitten and destruction shall be ready at his side it shall devour the strength of his skin even the firstborn of death shall devour his strength his confidence shall be rooted out of his tabernacle and it shall bring him to the king of terrors it shall dwell in his
habitation. His roots shall be dried up beneath, and above shall his branches be cut off. His remembrance shall perish from the earth. He shall have no name in the street. He shall be driven from light into darkness and chased out of the world. He shall neither have son nor nephew among his people, nor any remaining in his dwellings. They that come after him shall be astonished at his day. And they, they that went before were affrighted. Surely such are the dwellings of the wicked, and this is the place of him that knoweth not God. So how does Bildad start off? Well, he uses the law again, right? Remember, like I've been telling you, he, these, these men are just bashing Job over the head with the law. Uh, remember, remember that these guys believe that Job is suffering all of this. All, all that's happened to him. They believe... That this is because he has sinned you know uh, this causes him to be fresh you know this causes uh, Bill dad to be become frustrated with Job's attempt at defending himself you know Job's been constantly trying to defend himself telling him I'm not I haven't done these things you know and, and this is making Bill dad frustrated you know uh, <clears throat> Bill dad and the other two as well they believe that only the wicked suffer which we know, like we've been discussing here, we know that this, this is not true, but they believe this. You know, he believes that this suffering is the result of some judgment on Job. So they assume that Job must have committed some great sin and God is judging him for it. So let's look at verse 2. How long will it be ere you make an end of words? Mark, the, mark and afterwards we will speak. You know, he's asking Job essentially how to speak, right? That's what he said right there. He's asking him to consider the matter, and then they can speak on it more. So that, uh, so that word mark right there, that means to consider it, okay? Um, they are asking him to inform them so that they can understand it. You know, it's like going... Well, you, you're saying we don't understand what's going on. Well, then you tell us what's going on. You explain it to us. But, you know, Job can't do that because Job doesn't even know, right? <coughs> you know, since uh, he's told them how ignorant they are, you know, he, they want to they wanna understand it. Bildad has come, he's become very angry because of what Job has said. Just like the others, you know, he thinks that Job talks too much. You know, we already heard one say... You know, you're full of hot air. Well, Bill Dad feels the same. He feels like uh, Job's just talking way too much. You know, these these thing is, why don't you just hush? You know, he wants Job to just stop defending himself, and. And blame, 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 you know, beating him over the head with the law. And then they're not helping him at all. You know, we see how he insulted Bildad in verse 3. Let's look at that. Wherefore are we counted as beasts and reputed vile in your sight? You see right there that he's talking back about how earlier Job uh, said that they were beasts. You know, they were animals. You know, uh, he's telling Job, you know, you've insulted my intelligence, essentially. You know, guess why he's asking him, are we counted as beasts? You know, but didn't Job have every right to call them miserable? You know, look, look what they've been doing to him. He's got every right to call them miserable. You know, maybe even ungodly and wicked. You know, he's got every right to do that. These guys should have just stayed their butts home. You know, <laughs> uh, they, they, they should not have come uh, to Job and just sit here to beat him over the head with the law. You know, that's not the way to do things. Um, we then read, let's read on in verse 4, where we will, um, I know you notice something. Let's read that. He teareth himself in his anger. Shall the earth be forsaken for thee, and shall the rock be removed out of his place? You know, I want you to notice this right here. Bildad is speaking uh, of Job in the third person here. He tells Job that he tears himself. You know, uh, look at the words there. Shall the earth be forsaken? 
You know, this means that should God just uh, allow things to happen by chance? You know, it's, it's, uh, that's what atheists that everything just happens by chance. You know, that's what he, he's saying, you know, should the earth be forsaken? You know, he, just that it means by chance. Everything will just happen by chance without God's guidance. Um, he continues on. For thee, or as we would say today, for your sake. You know, should this, should God just allow the world to be forsaken? You know, for your sake. You know, um, I'm sure that Bill Dad would have said uh, to for him to just stop complaining. You know, he continues on. Shall the rock be removed out of his place? Have you ever noticed how in the uh, in the Bible the rock when the rock is mentioned, it's because of how unmovable it is. You know, um, God's counsel is like a rock. It's firm. It's uh, it's unmovable, unshakable, if you will. Um, you know, um, so he's asking, should God comply with Job because Job wants him to, right? That's what he's asking him here. Bildad is just cruel. He's saying that Job has become like that spoiled child. Have you ever been in the, in, in, like in the store and you see a mother or a father shopping, and that child's like, buy me something, and on the floor beating their fist, eh, because mom's saying, or dad is saying no. You know, Job is comparing, I mean, uh, Bill Dad is comparing Job to that child who's throwing a temper tantrum, screaming while mom shops. You know, according to Bill Dad, like I said, that, that's what Job is. He's that kid. And God is that mother or father, you know, that, that, that this spoiled child is trying to get to give him something. You know, um, he's saying that Job wants God to change the whole order of things strictly because uh, he needs it. You know, and it doesn't get any better. You know, he, he just begins to blister Job. We all know that the Bible often associates light with life and darkness with death. You know, God is the author of our lives. Um, so only God can light our lamps. You know, that's up to God. Look at Proverbs 13.9. We're going to look at it. I'll show you. Proverbs 13.9. In Proverbs 13, 9, we read, The light of the righteous rejoiceth, but the lamp of the wicked shall be put out. You see right there, we got this, um, you know, that darkness and light. Now, we can also see, if we turn to Acts 17, we're going to look at verses Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needs anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. That's Job 17, 25. Now also, let's look at verse 28 here. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets he have said, for we are also his offspring. Look at verse 5. Yea, the light of the wicked shall be put out, and the spark of his fire shall not shine. Now look how it starts off right there. I want you to pay attention to that. It says that word, yea. You know, um, we know that is yes. Basically, what it's the way the, the Bible saying, you can depend on this. You know, look at Jesus he, when he starts off, yea, I say unto you. It means you can count on it. You know, um, it's it, no matter how dissatisfied you are with it, you know, it's true. He continues on. The light of the wicked shall be put out, meaning that all of the glory of the wicked shall perish. Then he says, and the spark of his fire shall not shine, meaning his light shines only for a short time. And then it's gone. Poof. You know, like a, like a spark. 
Um, I want you to also notice that Bildad has started to speak on how t horrible things are, are, you know, how horrible things are waiting for the wicked. These friends think Job is wicked. It's just, it's horrible. Now, they think that Job is wicked and that uh, that that is why his blessings were taken away. You, know, you can really get that from this verse. So, if it is Job's light that was put out and will never shine again, according to Bildad anyway. So, let's go, move on to verse 6, where we see that he speaks of light again. The light shall be dark in his tabernacle. And his candle shall be put out with him. Now he isn't talking about the light in Job's eyes, but he's talking about the light in his tabernacle. So this is the light of his very nature, his very reasons, you know. Um, we can compare this to how he speaks of light shall be dark, you know, to what Jesus said. If you'll turn to Matthew chapter 6. We'll be looking at verse 23. Matthew 6, 23 says, <clears throat> But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body is darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? You see, um, see that light shall be dark, right? Now look at what he said here. In verse 6 of Job chapter 18. <laughs> His candle shall be put out of him. Out with him. You know, like I said, um, this could mean his spirit or his rational soul. You know, uh, we see uh, we see in Proverbs, we, it, they call it the candle of the Lord. If you'll look at Proverbs 20 verse 27, you'll see there. Proverbs 20, 27 says, The spirit of man <clears throat> So when you see belly in the Bible, usually that because it's an old English word meaning your insides. Now notice, like I said, it's called the candle of the Lord. Now the spirit, your spirit does not die. You know, uh, when we die, it just no longer cares, our spirit no longer cares for the things of this world because once we die, our spirit is with the Lord. You know, it's, 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 it's there worshiping the Lord. Um, <clears throat> we can, um, excuse me. So I guess in that manner, um, that means that this, you know, because there's the world's gone, the, the, its light is put out. And we can compare that with Psalms 146. In Psalms 146, we're going to look at verse 4. His breath goeth forth, he run, returneth to his earth, and that very day his thoughts perish. Notice that, the, his thoughts perish. Right there. So, it is more frequently used, uh, the candle, you know, like the candle of the Lord, is most frequently used to describe our outward prosperity which will be uh, with you up until the day you die. And when you die, your, your pro that prosper the prosperity is gone. You can't take it with you like we used to say. 
So if we go on to verse um, 7 here. The steps of his strength shall be straightened, and his own counsel shall cast him down. Uh, he speaks of steps there. Do you notice that? Uh, it makes me think of what my wife always says about how I walk. She tells me because I have legs. People with long legs take long steps. <clears throat> um... So, like this verse says here, you know, I walk with strength. Uh, a healthy person can take strong steps and travel uh, travel better. Now, look at uh, as a person who is prosperous takes large steps to obtain that reputation. You know, um, and a person who is, you know, they can do like a person with who's in better health who can take long, bigger steps. Now. Prosperous men, they tend to walk with pride, with their head held high, and uh, they do as they please, right? Now look at what he says here. And his own counsel shall cast him down. Now, we can compare this to the ruin of two others. If you'll turn with me to 2 Samuel 17. Wow, I flipped right there. We're going to look at verse 23. 2 Samuel 17, verse 23. Now, when I, when I read this, please, guys, if you're, if you're someone who's easily offended by me mispronouncing, And when Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his ass and arose, and got his home to his house, to his city, and put his household in order, and hanged himself and died, and was buried in the sepulcher of his father. Now what he's getting at is that his plots, you know, here in verse eight, seven, sorry, is that his plots, you know, his planning, if you will, to do harm on, to someone else that uh, they think will help themselves, you know, um, will lead to their own destruction. You know, it's like if you were planning on going out and, uh, you know, hurting someone because, you know, like if you're at work and you're planning on, you know, you're like, I need that job, I need that promotion. I'll just make this person look bad. Essentially, what this verse is saying is you're not hurting that person, you're hurting yourself. You know, a lot of people will do that. They will plot to take someone else down to make them look better. And in the end, you're not. You're hurting yourself. Amen? So basically what Bildad is saying here is that Job had once had all this great wealth, you know, he, he, he controlled this large area of land, but now he is in, he's in an isolated place. Snares in the next few verses. That is, you know, this is, nets and snares were used to catch animals. Now, Bildad here is saying that this is how a wicked man will meet his demise. Just look at verse 8. For he is cast into a net by his own feet, and he walketh upon a snare. Do you see right there? He's saying by his own design. That's why he says right there. He says right here, by his own feet. That means by his own design. He did this to himself. He says he walketh upon a snare. It means he wa he's walking around entangled. Because if you are in the net, if you if you ever messed with a net, you know the more you struggle, the more the tighter it'll get around you, the more tangled you become. He is saying that Job did this to himself. He thinks that Job had sinned against his people, and now he was paying for it. He snared himself in his own net. Now look at verse 9. The jinn 
shall take him by the heel, and the robber shall prevail against him. Now, this one is pretty self-explanatory, but I will explain one thing in it, and that's this word that we don't use today. It's gin. Now, when we think of this word, we think of an alcoholic beverage. Or if you know if you're not you don't drink you think of a, a, a card game gin, G I N. But this word is actually a trap. It was this you know wire was made out of like hammered steel. It was hammered into a real thin piece, and then it was made into basically like a noose or uh, and it was laid on the ground at night uh, as a way of snaring a thief. It would jerk them up in the air. It says like it's what it says right there. And it will take him by the heel, meaning it will lift him up. It will pull him up in the air. So let's move on to uh, verse 10. The snare is laid for him in the ground and a trap for him in the way. Uh, so the snare, this this uh, this gin, was laid on the ground. Uh, and it, you know... It, He's saying that it is hidden in the ground. But, you know, you see it in a lot of the old movies of older times. They, they lay it down. They cover it in leaves or something. It's, it's laid in the ground. Type of sharing he can think of. Well, there it went. Sorry about that, my sign fell behind me. <laughs> In verse 10 specifically, he says uh, two types of traps right here. He said he mentions the one in the ground and, you know, then he mentions a pit. Uh, so we'll move on to verse 11. Terrors shall make him afraid on every side and shall drive him to his feet. Now the terror spoken of here seems to speak of both manly fear you know and godly fear not only that but for uh for also his own thoughts you know and his own guilty conscience you know look right there where it says it shall drive him to his feet meaning it'll make him run away finding no place to hide that feels safe to him you know he's saying that this evil man has no peace at all you know he's like a scared child who's hiding from this imaginary boogeyman you know so let's go on to verse 12 and reread that one his strength shall be hunger bitten i'll show you if you look at me in Genesis 49, verse 3. So we're in Genesis 49, verse 3. <clears throat> Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength. The excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. So see right there that word shrink. He because of that verse where he mentions that his uh, his his firstborn son is his strength. People have taken this strength here in Job as to mean his firstborn son. But if you read this while reading this, nothing indicates that. There's no reason to believe this. This is anything but his strength. His you know. We shouldn't. T we don't need to take it that way. I think it's literally his strength. Then we see him say, "Destruction shall be ready at his side." This is just plainly saying that the traps will be waiting. You know, uh, they're just waiting there to just trip him up and destroy him. You know, I mean, look, it's saying he will be hungry, having no food to eat, and that his strength will fade away. We all know that if you do not eat, you will become hungry. You know, this is, of course, will lead to what?
An odd statement here. The firstborn of death. It's weird. Uh, well, it's an expression, and it means the you know the most deadly disease produced. The firstborn, the most deadly. You know, I think that this is speaking of the disease on Job's body, and how it's withered away. So it appeared to him that Job would would that Job will die very soon. Now let's look at verse fourteen. His confidence shall be rooted out of the tabernacle, and it shall bring him to the king of terrors. Now keep in mind what we read in verse 13. And look here at that word, the king of terrors. Now that would be death. And it's spoken of like a person. It's a personified version of death. We still do that today, don't we? We talk about the Grim Reaper or the angel of death. You know, we speak of death like he's a person. You know, the Romans did it, the Greeks did it, the Egyptians did it. Everybody spoke of death like it was a person. Especially someone to be feared. You know, um, like some ungodly terror. You know, Bildad wishes for these terrible things to happen to Job, who is supposed to be his friend. You know, all, for, all of these friends think that he must be some evil man. Now notice the mention of that the tabernacle. Now, I think this is talking about Job's home which had once been a safe place. Now let's read verse 15. It shall, it shall dwell in his tabernacle, because it is none of his. Brimstone shall be scattered upon his habitation. Now let's break this down. Remember in the last verse, I meant, uh, they, they mentioned the tabernacle. And like I told you, I believe it's Job's house. The tabernacle is no longer his. You know, like It seems that maybe it was taken from him for, violently. Look at where it says there. Brimstone shall be scattered upon his habitation. Now in the Old Testament... We would often see God rain fire and brimstone down on places to punish them, right? Um, like we saw in the cities of the plains. We'll turn there and read right real quick. Genesis 19. We're going to look at verse 24. Genesis 19, verse 24. Job. It's saying, uh, I believe Bildad is saying that God is going to, God is going to do the same thing he did to Sodom and Gomorrah to Job's home. We can compare this also to Deuteronomy 29, 23. And that the whole land therefore is brimstone and salt and burning that is not sown nor beareth nor any grass groweth therein like eleven six. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fires, and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. You know, at the beginning of verse 15, we saw that word it, I-T, it. Since it starts off the verse right after the last verse, we can assume that... Um, it's just telling it's speaking of the same thing. So if the last verse was speaking of these terrors, then it is also these terrors, correct? So this tells us that Job, you know, these that in that for Job, these terrors now inhabit his home. 
and God is going to rain this fire and this brimstone down on his home. That's what Bildad believes, that these terrors now live in Job's home, and you know, this fire and brimstone is going to rain down on him. So let's look at verse 16. His roots shall be dried up beneath, and above shall his branch be cut off. Wow. Now, basically, Bildad is referring back to what he had said in Job chapter 8, verse 12. Let's look at that real quick. Whilst it is yet in his greenness and not cut down, it withereth before any other herb. I have wrote down the wrong verse again, haven't I? Nope, that's it. So notice how it's, he's using these gardening terms here. And he's talking about cutting down and withered before, you know, any other herb. Right here he's alluding to Job's, the death of Job's children. You know, look what he says there. And above shall his branch be cut off. This is talking about Think of it this way. When we when we think of a family, we think of a tree, right? And then we, you know, the roots are your ancestors and then on up and then the children branch off. Right here, and he's talking about the branches shall be cut off. The offspring are the branches. <clears throat> Job's children were the branches. And we know that they were, because we've read, his children were his pride and joy. You know, he would pray for their sins. So, and he would make the offerings for their sins. Job would take care of them. So they were his pride and joy. So what Bildad is saying here is that, you know, these are cut off. And this is referring to the circumstances that Job was in. You know, his children were dead. He says that the root, he also says that the roots dried up. Now, at the time, the roots could have been you know, Job's prosperity, and it was now gone, it dried up, you know, like they, like they had no water, and his children's branches had been cut off, he's speaking of just utter destruction of a wicked man and his family, we can compare this to Malachi 4.1, you know, that, that one of our favorite books, right, Malachi, <laughs> Malachi 4 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. It's a great description of a tree that has been struck by lightning. You know, when I was a kid, I grew up in a, um, where we grew up, there was this tree out front that quite often would get struck by lightning. And it just was this, basically, if you would have seen it, it just was dry branches that go up and you could see where the lightning had struck it and split it. And nothing grew, it never grew a leaf. You know, it just was this dry stubble tree that stood there. And that's, this is a great description of that. The roots, you know, they can't gather any water. You know, it's saying that you know, basically what he's saying here is that uh, Job's ancestors will also be forgotten. And that Job will have no more descendants or branches, right? Let's go on to verse 17. His remembrance shall perish from the earth, and he shall have no name in the street. This is speaking of a doom that is feared more than any, any other, even today. You know, we can compare this to Jeremiah thirty-five nineteen. Jeremiah thirty-five nineteen. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rehab, shall not want a man to stand before me 
forever. Look, where, look right here in Job 18, 17, where it says, And he shall have no name in the street. No name in the street, right? Much less in the house of God or in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's kind of like saying, you know, look at Hitler. You know, his name isn't even spoken of in civilized conversations unless it's so, unless we're talking about the infamous he was, how bad he was, how evil he was. Um, that is the difference between a good man and a wicked man. You know, a good man will sit here and will speak of him proudly. An evil man we will sit here and will speak of him as despicable and evil. <coughs> now let's look at Proverbs eleven seventeen. The merciful man doeth good to his own soul, but he that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. You know, this shows us that how wrong Bildad was. You know, he says that Job won't be remembered, but here we are today speaking of him. You know, not only that, you know, but his story is one of the most talked about stories in the whole Bible. All right, let's look at verse 18. He shall be driven from light into darkness and chased out of the world. In Hebrew, in the Hebrew, if you were to read the Hebrew version of the story, it says, they shall drive him. It says, they shall drive him. Meaning his enemies. You know, this could be the people who he had oppressed because, you know, let's remember that this is how, this is what his friends thought he had done. That he had oppressed people. He goes on. From light into darkness. You know, from a splendid, splendid prosperous life into disgrace and misery, you know, and then and then eventually to the grave. You know, I think this really shows how much Bildad had listened. <laughs> you know, because he thinks that Job is dreading the grave, but if he had just been paying attention, he would have noticed that Job is welcoming it, right? Job is welcoming it. Bildad is saying that it'll be forced on him. Job is ready for it. Job's asking for it. Job wants it. He wants to die, you know. Uh, let's look at verse 19. He shall neither have son nor nephew among his people, nor any remaining in his dwelling. That is just cold-blooded. You know, he's saying that Job will remain childless. Uh, having no heirs to take care of his property, his estate, or even to continue his name. That's just cold. Bildad doesn't respect the situation that Job is in. Um, now, we know that he was wrong because Job does go on to have many, many, many children, right? You know, look where he says there, nor any remaining in his dwelling. So he's basically saying that no one is there because they had either died or run away in terror, you know? So yeah, I'm pretty sure that he was sitting there at the time, you know, if we were sitting there, All of his slaves are either dead, you know, dead or run off. He had no one, no one there. You know, and, and, and then it looked like he was about to die. There was no way in, 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 this, in our earthly world that we would know that he would recover and bear more children. But, you know, look what God did for Job. He restored him to health. He, gave, he blessed him with more children. God's wonderful. God is, God is graceful. So let's go on to verse 20. They that come after him shall be astonished at his day, and they that went before him will be affrighted. This is hard to understand, but let us look at it. So where him, see where him is in brackets there? Or it's italicized, sorry. I don't know why I put brackets, but it's italicized. Remember I told you that that, word, that means that that word was put there. It was um, helped to help it make sense. Because if not, it would go, They that came after shall be astonished. 
him is put there as in a tell us so that you know that the translators added it well I believe that this is uh, this should say at a time of his visitation you know they're astonished now we can we can compare this to Psalms 37 13 The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that the day is coming. We can also compare it to 137.7. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise, raise it, raise it, even to the foundation of thereof this is talking about the day it's overthrown right that's why it says remember the children in the day of Jerusalem this is meaning that the day is overthrown um, then it goes on as they that went before were affrighted. this says that when people see how Job is they're gonna be alarmed you know um, now, when I was researching this, I, 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 uh, I, I also looked at an NIV because, like I said, this verse is kind of hard to understand when you read it, with just when you just plainly read it. And when I re was reading in the NIV, it says, dwellers of the east, and then later on it says the west. And I found that kind of odd. Where did I put that? But strangers shall dwell in his possessions. The last groaned for him, and wonder seized of the first. See, um, so the strangers are dwelling in his possessions. They're dwelling in his home. You know, um, the, the one who came last groaned, and the first one was in wonder. You see? So I think this gives us the first indication of why Bildad was attacked. You know, why he's attacking Job so harshly. Because he's scared. He's frightened. It's plain and simple. He's frightened because he knows that this could happen to him. Amen? He knows that this could be him. And it scares him. He, he wants to believe that wicked men, you know, that only wicked men get to done this. Thing. So let's look at verse 21. Surely such are the dwellings of the wicked, and this is the place of him that knoweth not God. This is the last verse of the chapter, and uh, if you ever met me in person and you sat down and spoke with me about the Bible, you will notice one thing. I believe in the power of our own words. You know, if you were to sit there and constantly talk about how stupid you were, how dumb you were, you know, and you have people around you telling you the same thing. You're gonna, your, your, you, your mind will warp to that. And if you start, if people tell you your dreams are stupid, or you want this and that's stupid, eventually your mind will accept it. And you'll believe it. After Bildad illustrates the power. To damage someone. He does. Now I want you to turn with me real quick to Proverbs 12, 18. There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. I'll read that to you again. There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is healthy. Let's put that in a little bit of context. This is uh, this is uh, Solomon is speaking here of a lying tongue. He's talking about how it can hurt you know if you can hurt someone with your words, but if you're wise with your words, you can make someone better. You know if you you know if somebody 
not I wouldn't say praises you, but if someone offers you healthy advice and you take it, it'll help you. But if someone sits there and bashes on you constantly, it's just going to hurt you even more. You see, it's obvious here, you know, to anyone who reads this, that uh, Job is a very broken man. He's, he's, he's hurting. He's been through a lot. His family's dead. His land's been taken from him. His, his servants who probably, let's face it, Job was a great man. Job probably treated his servants with love and respect. So they probably were like friends to him. You know, these probably weren't just some um, someone who, you know, he came to work and he didn't even know him. You know, he, probably, he probably didn't look at them and go, you're number one, you're number two. From now on, I don't even know your name. You're number one, you're number two. You know, Job probably knew their names. He probably knew their families. You know, he probably he treated them probably very nicely. He probably fed them when they needed food. You know, um, they're gone. His family's gone. One person he's got left is his wife who, who, who told him to turn his back on God. Job is, you know, he's, he's broken. And what does Bildad do? What does any of his friends do? You know, they tear him to shreds. They rip him up. They treat him like crap. You know, now that I think about it, you know, if you wanted to counsel someone, you should read Job. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a great manual on how not to treat someone, how not to do it. You know, you're, you're, you're going to hurt people. You know, it also tells us why we shouldn't criticize people. Now, anyone looking here at the uh, the end verse, now let's look at there. Look at, the, look at the last part of this verse. That knoweth not God. You know, know in this sense is used as a redemptive word. You know, um, because if you look here, it's speaking of knoweth not. So these are people who, who do not know God. These are, uh, these people are not redeemed. They're unbelievers. You know, Bildad is trying to explain why he, you know, why he has said these things. He's trying to say that he's telling Job what happened to people who didn't know God. You know, this again shows us uh, that his friends believe that Job is a hypocrite. You know, because they believe that he's put on this front that he's a wise man of God, but he's they believe he's not a wise man of God. <clears throat> they believe he's a hypocrite, you know, the biggest sinner around. They honestly think that Job deserves this punishment that, he's, that they, uh, they feel he's receiving for these sins that they believe that he did, which we know he didn't do because God said that Job is an upright and righteous man. So it's obvious that they're wrong, you know. Um, Job was a true follower of God, and his friends believed that he wasn't. So... Thank you for joining me here today, guys. I really appreciate it. I love each and every one of you. Um, if you need me for something, all you've got to do is ask. Um, you know, I'm, I'm here for each of you. So thank you for joining me. I hope to see you here next week where we'll get to read uh, Job's response to Bildad's second uh, round of, of bashing on him.